our suffering, my dear. There's not enough scotch in the world for that one. <laughs> Charlie, what are you writing now? A little novella. I'm calling none of your goddamn business. <laughs> We were invited to stay here for a few days until we could find a place. Shirley has these bouts. I read your story. What are you doing in here? It made me feel thrillingly horrible. Do you know what it's like to have a secret? When I first saw it, I was like, it's like a fever dream. And that's what was exciting to me because it felt like a study on that thin veil between mm. the subconscious and the conscious, between dreaming and waking. And it was really like the psychological space that or lived in and where I was going, right. you know? Hi, I'm Josephine Decker. I'm the director of the feature film, Shirley. Hi, I'm Tamar Kali, the composer for the feature film, Shirley. So Tamar, we had a crazy short time to do the composing for this film, which is which in retrospect was so silly because then we ended up premiering like six months after we locked picture. <laughs> um, but I guess I was just curious, like how did you, how you work under pressure and also like where you go for inspiration kind of when you're starting a project? Well, my first um, foray into film scoring was a really ridiculously tight schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, Mudbound, I wrote, recorded, mixed in four and a half weeks. And it was the first time I'd ever scored for film. So I really got a trial by fire. And so anything that grants me a little more time than that is kind of like pie, you know, at that, at that point. But also what was great is that we had a little bit of a courting period because I saw the film and you and I spoke, but then there was a little time before mm. we ended up actually coming together to work on it. So I had a lot of time to digest your work and mm. really have feelings about it. And also I was doing like a lot of research about Shirley, just her real life, since it's, you know, the novel is a fictionalized you know, telling of her life. So I was delving into a lot of that stuff. So by the time we were ready to really get working, I had a lot of time to sit mm. with your work and just, you know, the, the biography of Shirley. Mm. How did you feel, by the way, I'm so curious, with temp score, how do you feel about temp score? Do you find that it helps you or do you find that sometimes it throws you off or, or is it just sort of some t- changes every movie? Well, it has the reputation of being the bane of every component of existence. But since I feel relatively still fresh and new in this world, I'm trying not to like develop any impressions or like solid ideas about how things are going to function. And one of the things that helped me do that actually was your temp and Shirley. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but I was telling you that it was the most interestingly tempt film I had ever seen. And that really made me want to take a stab at it because oh, I was wow. like, I was just like, oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, it was, it was eclectic. It was emotional. It was beautiful. And because of your references in terms of other art forms, whether it be music or whatever, how you came to it was really earnest or authentic. I don't think you were just like grabbing a bunch of keys from other people's movies and throwing them on your film. And I think that's what made a huge difference. Like it, 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 it functioned almost as like a peek into your mind in terms mm. of your aesthetic musically and almost like a playlist for the emotions that you were trying to convey through the music. Like I really appreciate it. It was a great um, roadmap. Usually I temp with like pieces, like standalone, like kind of usually like new music, weird, weird, you know, ex- esoteric classical, you know, pieces or, or in that vein. Like I remember the, the temp for, there was one really crazy temp song that actually you, you like, I, I love what you ended up doing there. It was like the, uh, when Rose and Fred are having sex and she sort of like decides to dominate him. And it was like this weird, like, atonal modernist piece <laughs> and it was just and I was like I don't know how like what tomorrow's gonna do with this and then what you did was like so awesome it was like so wild and and it had it had actually yeah a flavor that had that same like kind of like unexpected I have no idea what instrument's gonna play next I have no idea what um you know what rhythm is gonna come
that was one of those pieces <laughs> that um, in retrospect, it, I really was cracking up about the process because I was watching it on loop and it's like this raw sex scene, you know? And it was like, I'm in a room by myself in the studio's room. I'm like watching this raw sex scene like 20 times in a row and like trying to, you know, get the vibe. It was just, it was just such a, it was such a journey. It was such a ride, the whole process. But we worked, you know, when we are working with Nancy, the music editor, we did develop some themes right away because mm. Um, and, and connecting to that cue, it was this theme around uh, activation, like when mm. Roses gets activated in this way, kind of like by the spirit or the idea of Shirley as this non-conventional woman and possession. So those were some of the things we were playing with that mm. we would read musical motifs for. So that one went really left, but it was still <laughs> like in, in, in the realm of that stuff that we were exploring around yes. like, Session and you know activating this other personality. One of the things that I love so much about our score, and we talked, we were just talking about it early on, was the voice and um, and you know feeling like okay, there's a movie about women's voices, you know, and women kind of finding their voices, whether that's an, an author's narrative voice or whether Rose is sort of finding her voice in a larger like, who am I as a person kind of sense. And um, I think we talked a lot about how voices felt important and. And it was so fun to hear the way that you kind of we went wild with your voice in the movie. And it was such, it's such a pleasure. Like I just get so much joy out of hearing those cues. Like, <laughs> Well, you pushed me. I always, whenever, you know, I have the pleasure of talking about the score, I talk about how as this auteur filmmaker, your bravery and how for me, I usually try you know, I'm, when I have a musical idea, I try to be very sensitive about how I present it because, you know, when a director has gotten to the point where you're dealing with score, oftentimes you've sat with this film for maybe years, mm -hmm. you've gone all the, the parts up and this is kind of like the icing, right? And so I don't want to, I know you need something to react to, but at the same time, I'm not trying to push the envelope where you're gonna have a strong negative reaction. So I try to temper my ideas as I'm moving along. And with you, I, I would be like, okay, all right, you know, and then you'd be like, oh yeah, more, more, you know, and I was just like, <laughs> you really wanted me to swing for the fences. And um, that, that was awesome. It was a very freeing process because I had just come out of a project that was definitely more structured and just in terms of the freedom that I had and the fact that you were requesting me to really push it was was awesome so it's like you know you're, you're very much a part of that because i would do a little something and you're like I, what was which i can't remember what cue it was oh um the miscarriage scene oh and yes it, like i was doing some stuff and then i did some you know and you were like oh what was that like you're like more <laughs> of that you know and so then i just started like yipping on the you know and i was just like wow i could really just go off Oh yeah, I love that cue. Oh my gosh, yeah, and the ending too. Uh, the very end, the cliff. You know that you gave mm -hmm. some. There was so much like magical voice work that you were doing. Thank you. How and I mean, we spoke about that, like the importance yeah. of you know. I, that's another thing that like made this project feel like, oh yeah, I definitely want to do this. When you were just saying that you were interested in exploring the female voice as a lead mm -hmm. instrument in the score, you know, because I wonder had you not kind of created that prompt where this score would have landed. And I was able to really lean on my classical choral background. And I gave each, the three women, they all, they each had their voice. Like, mm. you know, um, Rose was a mezzo-soprano, Paula was a soprano and Shirley's the alto. Oh, wow. I didn't know you did that. That's so cool. That makes sense. <laughs> Step away. You were right, it doesn't take any energy at all. 
so effective i love that i mean that's i think that's something really haunting about and, and exciting about the score is that like there there is this physicality you know, the viscerality of the human body is in the score which is so um uh which is wild you know which is kind of the emergence of wildness you know and so you <laughs> it feels like it really supports these women kind of like you know like <laughs> cracking themselves open. Sometimes I'm not so experimental. I'm like, you know, give me a framework and I'll figure out my space in there. And with you, you were very open to the process of exploration, mm. you know, and just seeing how it goes, giving the artists you collaborate with agency to bring their ideas to the table and just figure it out. And um, I remember saying to you, I was like, oh, you know, that's really great. <laughs> I feel like, you know, I always want to be like, okay, let's just have a plan. We can go off the rails, but can we, can we just figure it out, you know? And I don't know if that's a function of living in a society where I, I have something to push against, mm. but I remember like that was, that's a big part of your process. And mm. I was really inspired by that. And so I was able to trust it, you know? I'm curious, like how, because you, I remember when you started jamming out uh, music, I was like, I don't know how she's getting this much creative inspiration this quickly because like I think one of the first pieces you wrote was this emissary captive queen piece that was like stunning Paula normally hated socializing at school, but she forced herself to do it. Hi, Caroline. Back again, Mrs. Nemser. <laughs> My, you are a voracious reader. You know, you and Fred should come to the house. The dean and I would love to have you. Plus, it must be rather dull for young folks like you to spend all your time with... with that woman, I mean. I hear she never leaves the house, or her bed for that matter. She's gone sick in the head. Uh, no, she's she's working quite hard. Every hour, every day. I only get my information from Stanley. She was relieved to spot someone lurking near the punch bowl, looking as miserable as she felt. But his was a face that she'd never seen before on campus. And men were always easily spotted. Hi, man, huh? Yes, sir. I can't get my carriers to deliver up there anymore. She writes stories with cannibalism in them. That's what I've heard. Mr. Fisher, do you, um, do you often give young girls rides in your postal truck? I'm not sure I like your question. 
Oh, I just mean, is it a habit of yours to shuttle college girls along your route? Paula was proud of the way she contradicted him, how she stayed ahead of the conversation. This is what it's like to be a grown woman talking to a man. I never seen Paula before that day in my life. Giving her a ride was a Samaritan thing to do. Girl was half frozen, nothing but thin sneakers on. Said she was going for a hike. I wasn't going to get any further into her business. But I didn't like that, seeing it was almost sundown. She had no knapsack. She had no provisions. I assume she must have been meeting someone. When they were at the party, he had barely looked at her. His voice had a lightness. Let's go somewhere quieter, he said. A hand on her back. But now, but now, away from everyone, his voice was muted, floating above her. And she couldn't. She couldn't contradict him. For a cue like that, where there's lots of voiceover and there's conversation, um, I love when I get to write through stuff like that um, because I don't come from a traditional film score writing background. So when, how, how do I say this? So I know that when you're taking it at conservatory or you're taking it at university, there are these rules yeah. and apparently I, I break a lot of them, but what it is, for me is that I'm just thinking in terms of live music, polyphonic um, environments, you know, polytonal environments. How does everybody play together nicely? Mm. And you can have a lead instrument in a scene where people are talking. You just have to know how to place it. And it's not so much about the mix, but where you're placing the movement of the instrument. It's, it's a dance, mm. you know? And so you have to like, carve space around the dialogue. And mm -hmm. you can do it in a way that's tasteful, I, I believe, you know. I, I don't think there's really a cardinal sin where that is concerned, depending on what the work is. Right, right. Yeah, and I think it makes it, I think it's it's really important. And especially in a movie like this, where the film is sort of haunted by this other presence, that there is this character that Shirley and Rose are researching together that is in a way you really uniting them. There's a, there is another presence in the movie that, you, that we are, are, we're trying in so many ways to bring out. And I think the score is a way that that kind of, that that presence was really making itself known and it's almost needs, it almost requires like to have its own voice. Yeah. And I gave her one, it wasn't like we treated her like a footnote or just, um, you know, a vehicle yeah. for the story. It's like, and that's why I say three voices because it's Shirley, Rose, and the missing girl, Paula. Like Paula is certainly a character in the film. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's, you know, like how she's carved out so humanely. Um, I, 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 I don't know, I, I just wonder about that, how people usually present someone who isn't going to physically be there, but is a thought, a memory, or someone that doesn't have physical, isn't taking up physical space. Mm -hmm. I felt like we honored the, her her fully, you know? Yeah, yeah, very much so. I, I agree. I think that was one of the big discoveries in editing, honestly, because, well, she obviously, we shot a bit of her during this shoot. Um, when we got into editing, we were like, oh, we really need to bring out Paula so that we were able to follow the, this character. And we, we actually ended up adding a lot of the voiceover narration sections in the edit. And Sarah, our writer wrote these incredible like faux Shirley <laughs> um, uh, kind of like snippets from Shirley's like writing that then that became kind of her first drafts of, of this novel. Um, and that I think really br brought in, you know, okay, you know, when is Shirley, um, really connecting to Rose? When is Rose inspiring something uh, something about this character? When is Shirley reacting against Rose in this work? It's really daring and risky because technically she's embodied by Odessa, that same actress yeah. that's playing um, Rose. So, you know, it's like, definitely, I think, but what's so interesting is that there was never, I always knew when it was Rose or when it was Paula. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, because of that, that the, the the breadcrumb piece, you know, just the the introduction of Paula's voice, you know, the fact that there are three singular voices that come together mm -hmm. to create the chord that is the story. Gosh, it's so fun to get to like remember this time working and, on this and, with you. I was just what a pleasure. For me, it's a it's gonna stick out. 
this work I did with you is definitely going to stick out in the long run. I, I feel that it will have a lasting presence. And thank you for making awesome art.